Welcome guys to another inspiring episode of Home Base Hope. I hope you've had a really positive fortnight making lots of little gains at Home Base. As you know, I like to talk to the professionals in the industry who are doing things a little differently, who aren't afraid to step outside the box and provide us with a new way of seeing things. And today's guest does exactly that. Today we're talking to Angela Hanscom. Angela is a pediatric occupational therapist based in the US and is the founder of Timbernook, an award-winning developmental and nature-based program that has gained international popularity. Angela is not your traditional therapist. She is known for her out-of-the-box thinking and is passionate about reconnecting children with nature. Angela is the author of Balanced and Barefoot, how unrestricted outdoor play makes for strong, confident and capable children. She was awarded the Hometown Hero by Glamour Magazine for her innovative work with Timbernook and has also been a frequent contributor to the Washington Post. Angela has treated many children over the years that presented with sensory deprivations, uncoordinated bodies and behavioural issues that she feels is largely due to the lack of unstructured playtime in the great outdoors and the nutritional habits of our society today. Welcome, Angela. Thanks for having me. Uh, It's so lovely to have you on the show. I'm very grateful that you're here to share all your wisdom with us. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so I wanted to start off with your journey, a little bit about your journey, maybe what growing up was like for you as a child and how you came to do what you're doing today. Great. So I grew up in a rural area of Vermont in the States, and, um, you know, I was allowed to play outside till the lights went off. Um, Just a very traditional outdoor childhood. I lived in um, kind of the suburbs, and we would bike everywhere. Um, And how I started Timbernook is an interesting story. It was uh, never planned, and it was something that just really came... um, after having my own children and starting to realize that there wasn't, children really weren't playing outside like I remember it. And also noticing when I was in a clinic setting as a pediatric occupational therapist, how there was this increase in um, sensory issues, like not wanting wind in their face um, and children not liking getting dirty um, and more and more kids starting to fall. And so I just started really paying attention to things around me and it kind of set me on this path. Mm, interesting. Um, so, so what exactly ignited this passion to create such an innovative, therapeutic outdoor nature program? What What was that? Right. So, so it really was. I guess um, it started when my second daughter was born, um, and I actually. Um, worked in a traditional clinic setting and noticed, you know, I did have a child come in and say, um, the mother said this child doesn't tolerate wind in his face. And I'm like, I remember thinking to myself, how do I treat this in a clinic (laughs) setting? Um, Because we, you know, we are often in sensory gyms or um, found inside. And so I was thinking, do I get a fan and blow the fan in his face? Like, um, and just being confused by that. Um, And then, um, we also had a wait list that went out at least a year. And so we kept hiring more and more occupational therapists in our sensory gym. And there was never enough space to treat these children. And so I thought that was really interesting. Um, and I remember reflecting on that, why this huge rise in occupational therapy services. Because when I was little, occupational therapy was pretty rare. It was really reserved for children with you know, muscular Um, muscular issues or cerebral palsy, um, Down syndrome, that sort of thing, more severe disabilities. And so um, my youngest daughter, when she was four, um, I just, you know, I started realizing that a lot of her friends needed occupational therapy services as well. And um, so that surprised me. Um, Mm -hmm. And then when I decided to stay home, I started, so my second daughter was born, I decided to take a break from working and joined a mom's group. And I had friends coming up to me saying, why is my daughter spinning in circles all the time? And I was like, oh, that's a really interesting question. And then I had another one come up to me and say, why? My daughter's in preschool and she can't pay attention. Again, I was like, wow, this is, this is so interesting. And then when my daughter was ready for kindergarten, 
um, this is what really lit my fire was basically um, the kindergarten teacher told us this is not kindergarten like you remember growing up and she said we're not gonna have time to teach your children how to cut with scissors my husband's gonna pre-cut everything at nighttime um, if your children cannot tie their shoes then please put them in elastic laces or velcro because we won't have time to teach your children how to tie shoes and then she said we'll have a five-minute working snack and if that gets in the way of curriculum then we're gonna um, we're gonna take snack away and it will be a working snack kind of thing um, and then they had a 15-minute recess session and she said when it snows it's gonna be indoor recess because we don't have time to change them into gear to go outside and so all those things came true. Um, they um, did have a five-minute working snack. They ended up not having time for a snack <laughs> as a separate thing. And then they um, took away recess and did indoor recess um, as soon as it snowed. And so I ended up um, pulling my daughter out of school. And that was a really big deal for me because, I'm a, uh, first of all, I'm a huge nerd and I enjoy learning. And so that was really hard for me. And I remember loving kindergarten. I remember kindergarten, um, we had a full hour recess session. I think we might have had two recesses. And it was just a half day program. And the teacher sang Little Bunny Foo Foo every day. And um, we learned our letters. It was very laid back. I remember cutting myself. So I know we use scissors because I went to the nurse's office. Um, but, you know, I. I don't, it was very play-based, and so to be in a program where they felt like snack and, you know, recess got in the way of curriculum um, and not having time to cut and use your fingers and your muscles really didn't um, resonate very well with me, you know, especially because as a therapist, you know, um, development and developing the hands and using the body and stuff to learn is so important. So, um it really set me on the path to looking at different educational philosophies because I ended up homeschooling for a couple of years. And so I learned about Reggio Emilia approach where the environment um, is really set up as the third teacher. And I learned about the Waldorf philosophy where there's a nice flow to the day. Um, and some other philosophies like and also in Finland where the kids are in the river learning about fish and dissecting them. And so that's when I decided um, I wanted to do something with getting kids outdoors. Um, and that that kind of set me on this path of looking at play as important. Because I do remember working, mentoring with someone that did Reggio Emilia. And I kept um, wanting to put my ideas. I said I, ha I had such great ideas. So I was like, oh, I think the kids should do this. And she kept saying, Angie, will you just relax? And she's like, they're playing right now, and they this is the best way for them to learn. And so really even for me to like step back a little bit and realize that there's nothing better than play, especially in the early years, um, for learning experiences. So that's how it started. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. And I think I have really got a lot of good pointers out of your book, uh, Balanced and Barefoot, as well for my own practice. And, you know, I think we all inherently know that nature is good for us. But I think to the untrained eye, therapy in nature just does. It looks like play, you know, like what you were saying. We want to try and intervene more. Um, and, you know, an outdoor OT in the bush or at the beach is just totally a foreign concept. And there's no special equipment, there's no mats, there's no gym balls, there's no climbing frames, there's no whiteboards, there's no mirrors, and there's certainly no electronic devices. Um, can you describe what therapy in nature actually looks like so we can just get an image in our head? Right. Well, it looks very different. Um, I really feel like um, I guess the program that I do is not, it's not considered therapy. It's definitely therapeutic, but it's, um, I almost feel like it's the ideal environment for children because it's, it's kids out in nature and um, playing on a really grand scale. And um, I feel like the environment is so key here. So, and this really translates well to the OT world, is that the environment inspires and challenges development. And so if you look at the environment of outdoors and compare that to sensory gyms, it's totally different environments. Um, so let's really bring it down to a very simple example. And one is like the balance beam. 
So if you look at, um, in sensory clinics, you often see those plastic engineered balance beams that are, they have little pickies on them, like the, um, they're textured. They're like textured balance beams that are plastic and brightly colored. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, yep, and I do um, So if you, you know, picture a child walking barefoot inside on one of those plastic balance beams, which usually cost a couple hundred dollars. They're very expensive. And then picture a child walking barefoot outside on a log, and let's say the log's going over water. Um, and then, and I have, usually when I do speaking engagements, I have the audience look at the images and really dissect, like, now both of these are sensory experiences. We consider walking on a plastic balance beam a sensory experience and walking outside barefoot as a sensory experience, and I, I usually say, which one do you think engages more senses? And um, and then you'll often hear things like, well, obviously the log. Um, for instance, the whole log is dynamic, so when you walk on it, it moves. Um, in the picture, you can actually see that the feet curve around the, the log more than it does on the plastic beam, so the actual foot muscles are working harder, um, gripping, trying to stay on, because there's an element of risk, because um, you could fall into the water. And then all the things that are around you, right? So the wind, and it could be raining on you. Um, the whole depth perception, I mean, you can see really far away or up close. And then you have bird sounds, um, which help with spatial awareness, and all kinds of things happening that actually help to organize the senses when you're outside. Versus indoors, you're really taking a lot of those elements away um, and not quite challenging the senses as much. Mm. I think it is just an absolutely amazing way of looking at it. And I've got to say that I have been enormously inspired and influenced by your work um, that I am now capitalizing on the therapeutic benefits of nature in my own practice. Oh, my um, God. Yeah, I, I live in the Northern Territory in Australia and it's very hot here all year round. And right. um, I've been seeing a young four-year-old boy who's on the spectrum and we're working towards resilience and we've got some sensory processing issues that we're working on. And yeah. um, I, I run a mobile therapy service so I can facilitate the sessions wherever I like, which is perfect oh. um, for this sort of paradigm, I suppose, of OT. Um, yeah. And so the other day I took him to the hot springs, which is this beautiful location surrounded by nature. And it was just the perfect location to work on our goals. Obviously, the environment is more unpredictable. And, um, you know, the clinical setting is very predictable. Um, right. And, you know, this was great for this particular child because we were working on resilience and the environment itself had that inbuilt challenge of... Um, not sort of sure exactly what was coming up and um, for some children you know I think you need to work on on building that up um, but it was perfect for this child and obviously the textures in the environment are something that you just like you said you can't replicate them in the clinical setting exactly. we had the moss on the rocks it's the free flowing water it's the dirt it's the rough bark and um yeah, I mean, it's you can't get a more sensory rich environment if you tried. But yes. I think we are so conditioned uh, to stick to what we know, which is therapy in a clinic. And that's sort of, mm -hmm. you know, what we pay for because I think parents think, you know, well, I can do that myself. Um, and that's true. You know, parents can take their children outside. So what, what are the benefits of taking, you know, for parents to take their child out um, of the four walls into an open space, what sort of benefits can they um, reap from this? Oh my gosh, so many. <laughs> um, so there's there's many. Like so, first of all, um, I feel like sensory integration really ha happens in a calm, alert state. And so, if you think about even the colors of outside, you see what colors like blues. Um, greens and browns and it's a very calming stimuli in fact the nature sounds are very calming like um, you'll go for massage and you hear crashing waves and all that that sort of thing and um, there's even research about the smells of certain trees outside will reduce cortisol levels so it's very calming outside but you're alert right because you have to pay attention um, the grounds uneven <clears throat> it might be more challenging and so you're in the ideal state for sensory integration. Um, 
And versus a lot of times in indoor environments, like in the school or in the house, you might have posters everywhere, you might have pictures all over the house, and it can be um, sensory overwhelming. So just thinking about how much is in a child in an environment where they're in a um, calm and alert state, what percentage of time are they in an ideal state for sensory integration, and what percentage of time are they in an environment where it's um, sensory overwhelming? Maybe there's yelling going on, that sort of thing. Um, so even just stepping outdoors is, is conducive to sensory integration. And plus you have multiple senses engaged at once, so your synapses are firing. So you're going to have a, a light, more likely chance to organize the senses. Um, and then you're challenging the senses, right? So you're challenging your balance as you walk on uneven terrain. Or if the baby's crawling, like imagine even just crawling inside where everything's flat and the baby doesn't have to think about it. And then you take them outside, and it's rolling hills, and the textures are constantly changing. And you're, every time you go over pebbles, it's pushing on different muscles and strengthening the whole hand um, versus on certain parts of a flat um, surface would strengthen certain parts of your hand. So even just crawling outside is going to challenge the muscles more and develop better. Um, climbing. Climbing is another great example. So, like, um, let's say inside a gym they're doing monkey bars and it's always going to be um, putting point of contact on one part of your skin and so then you might get a rip right because this is really strong but this is weak and then you could get blisters and it rips well if you're um, climbing on trees the tree limb is different every time and so you're stimulating different parts of the hand so you're going to get even just your skin is all going to get much stronger um, and all the muscles in the hands and same when you're walking barefoot so you're going to have um, stronger feet muscles and stronger ankle muscles. So um, you're going to get a much more strong and capable child. It's like cross training playing outside. Um, so every time they walk, it's different and you're constantly challenging muscles and balance. Yeah. And look, I think everything that you touched on is so very important for a child on the spectrum. Um, I want to jump back to the calming you mentioned at the start. Mm -hmm. um, it's nature is very calming for children. And for children who particularly live in this state of flight or fight, um, they need that, that calming space. And often, you know, we will create an, a calming environment in the house somewhere. Um, but what, what can parents be doing outside? You know, is it just taking them outside? Are there any specific calming activities outside that you can remember? Um, that you can recommend for children who may be having meltdowns or um, anxiety or stress? What can they do? You know, I think like water and mud play is actually really good for kids that need regulation. So if you think about it, um, like the sounds of water, like playing by stream is very calming. And also digging in the dirt, like in that, that sense of mud and digging, because um, you're overriding that light touch sense when you're digging. It's like the brushing, right? But only they're doing it naturally. Um, but just the mud play itself, and I know that for play therapists, um, that they tend to use a lot of sand and water and it's very rudimentary play and it's very organizing to the brain so I would recommend water and mud play and you can do that by going to garage sales I don't know if you call it garage sales over there <laughs> yeah we do yeah sales. okay um, but you know instead of getting like pails you know and shovels that sort of thing going to a yard sale and getting like real um, bowls and pots and pans and pitchers that are stainless steel really heavy duty so um, it gives you nice input to your joints and muscles picking them up and digging and it inspires um, some creative play too um, and it kids want to use that stuff because um, mm. it's adult adult items is a great way to inspire play mm. outside well let's touch on the messy play now that you have brought it up um, yeah, look, I know when I pick my kids up from school or childcare that they have had an awesome day if they are covered head to toe in dirt and their shoes are full of uh, sand. Um, yep. And, you know, playing outdoors is just downright dirty. It can be. And for some children on the spectrum, this can cause stress in itself. You know, the, the kids who are very defensive to uh, the mud or the sand and they 
you know, it causes a meltdown. So I know you are a big advocate for mud and messy play, but how do you in your work overcome these challenges so that the kids who are defensive to these sorts of textures can actually enjoy this play without feeling um, left out or feeling that stress and anxiety? That's a great question. Um, I feel like Timbernook helps override some of those things because there's um, the environment is set up in an inspiring way, so it's very enticing. Um, so we'll often play in our giant mud puddles over here. And um, the children, the other children are also inspiration. So one thing we always make sure we don't do is um, even just suggest that they try taking their shoes off or that they go into the mud puddle because when children have any sensory issues, there's often anxiety tied to that. And so even just saying, why don't you take your shoes off can actually increase the anxiety level. So here's a great example. We had a little boy that did not, he, he said, I will go to your mud puddles, but I'm not taking my shoes off. And he had autism. And I said, that's fine. So we went down and he had these plastic welly boots again. And we went down and some little boys were in the puddle and they were catching frogs. And so to him, that was very meaningful. So also making sure it's a meaningful experience. Right away, he, he went in. <laughs> the mud went into his welly boots, which feels really gross. And so he came back out and he was like, can I take these off? Cause, and so I said, sure. So just giving him permission and a choice. And so he, what he did was he took them off and he went in barefoot. Now, this little boy had gone two years in therapy trying to go barefoot. Um, I don't know what, you know, probably with the plastic balance beams, I don't know, but, um, but no success, but, um, he went right in, he started going camping and going barefoot and, um, his, his mom was super excited. Um, but it was a real environment, you know, he was going barefoot in the mud. And so it was gen, you know, generalized well to, um, camping and that sort of thing. Now, if I had said, no, I, I think you should take your shoes off before, what do you think would have happened? You know, is usually, you know, he would have said, no, I'm not going to. So it was a choice. I believe play should be a choice. Um, and so, you know, even with climbing trees, we'll never say, hey, why don't you climb the tree? That's why I feel like Timberdick's so powerful is because they'll see the other kids doing it. And so they, they want to try or it becomes meaningful to them because it's real life. It's real play to them. Um, and so they get become inspired. Mm -hmm. And so that's different than traditional therapy so for traditional therapy sometimes you're by yourself with a child and it's it's a different when you have real environments and kids are really creating societies out there they take play to a different level and they push and challenge themselves so we're seeing transformation in these kids that that is very hard to replicate because it's very real world um, whereas in therapy sessions sometimes it's a little bit like you're trying to get that and it's a little bit more of a challenge if that makes sense mm. so neurotypical quote-unquote kids um right are good with that unstructured play i suppose children on the spectrum require that little bit more guidance and direction with their play you know they're in their own world and if we don't sort of tap into it they'll continue just to display mm -hmm. those repetitive behaviors um how could you encourage more outdoor play with the children who get bored easily or who don't want to play or who sort of get lost in their own world and um, don't have the imagination skills of other kids their age? I think it's very similar. I think setting up an environment to inspire them and have real life, real children there. It's the same with my own children. Like when other kids are over, they're much more likely to be adventurous and go off and be inspired to play than when they're by themselves. It's a much more of a chore. I think it's the same with children with autism that if they have other children and peers out there, so you like so a parent could invite other children over um, and and go outside with them, and you don't have to. And you actually, it's very different philosophy, but it's really stepping back a little bit to see what they come up with, um, and it takes practice. And so what we do is we set up the environment environment to inspire them um, and it's it's actually um, if you create a meaningful environment you don't need a lot of adult adult intervention and it for kids with autism anywhere on the spectrum um, we have had children that that had autism come and like they would um, 
I remember one little boy was replaying his video games, and by the end of the week, he was like replaying, like building a fire and doing it, but on his own. Like, and often he would be invited into the play, and he would get into the play with them, and um, so it was really interesting because it was the environment was inspiring him, um, and he had a one-on-one -on -one aid, and by the end, they didn't, he didn't need the one-on-one -on -one aid, and you couldn't tell who had a disability and who didn't in the program. That's amazing. And I think you touched on their, you know, electronics. And mm. there are kids who have absolutely no interest at all in going outside. And I think technology has a, such a big role to play in this these days. You know, there's yeah. the app. Xbox, the TV, the iPads, there's the PS4. I can't even keep up to date with all the gadgets that kids have these days. When I when I go to my home visit, they're like, can I show you my latest game on the PS4 and this and that? And um, it's, they're, they're hooked. And particularly kids yeah. on the spectrum, I find um, they, they like this type of environment because it's safe. They don't have to develop their sensory processing skills um, and, you know, they don't have to have that social communication element. You know, they're in their safe environment. Um, but I think we really need to try and encourage kids to get out and, um, yeah, in encourage them to climb a tree over playing the PS4 and sort of set some time limits on what is reasonable um, screen time. Absolutely. Um, even my own kids, like, we, they watch a movie once a week and then um, – they do. They have tablets because my dad's a computer engineer, <laughs> so they get. But um, they only use it once in a great while um, because I feel like it's just what's happening is it becomes almost an addiction. Um, I remember when they were little. I remember doing well. Okay, we have half an hour a day, but then they be, they felt entitled to have that half hour before they would do anything else, and it became a habit. Um, so we really just have it as a treat once in a while now, and so they just know it's time to go outside. So it's really just um, you know just a different way of thinking. Like we don't need this, you know. And later they'll have plenty of time with that. Um, so. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we never needed it how many years ago. You know, it's just such a right. culture these days, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. And, yes. and kids easily fall into that trap. So I think it's, you know, up to the parents to sort of set some rules and restrictions right. about what they can and can't do. Um, yeah, so when I think about playing outside, the first things that come to my mind are children running they're swinging they're rolling down hills they're hopping along and skipping you know there's a lot of movement um would you mind explaining how important movement is to the body um and in particular our vestibular system what it is and how parents can further develop it sure um, so the vestibular system is really important, um, and it's key to all the other senses. Um, so you really just described it, like you really, um, you want to be able to move in all different directions, um, so that the fluid moves back and forth in the inner ear and stimulates those little hair cells in there. And that develops your vestibular system, also known as your balance sense. And, um, that really helps you to get from point A to point B safely. Um, it's one reason why sometimes kids will spin in circles. It's really important for the vestibular system. And so to just, you know, sometimes be careful about saying don't spin, you're gonna get dizzy, that whole mindset, because that's actually really um, something we use in therapy to help children know where their body is in space. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you often hear therapists say, you know, it's important to cross midline. Well, we can't cross midline till we have a midline, and that's really um, gathered through, you know, core strength, like mm -hmm. having strong um, stomach muscles and back muscles, but also spinning is another way to know where your midline is. Um, so in order to have that basic coordination, they need to be able to spin um, or roll down the hill is another way of looking at it, because you're spinning on your own axis. Mm -hmm. um, and so the same thing. Um, and it also helps with supporting all six eye muscles, so it acts like a, a, a tripod for a camera and helps stabilize so the eyes can move back and forth, which is important for reading and writing um, and um, to be able to um, function with the eye muscles. Um, and then the other thing is it helps with attention. So it turns a reticular activating system on in the brain to pay attention. And that's often why kids fidget. So they're moving back and forth to ignite that vestibular system 
to turn the brain on to pay attention. Mm-hmm. And um, teachers will often say, sit still or stop moving. Um, but it really is important for kids um, to move throughout the day. Um, children of all abilities should have, you know, a good portion of their time outside. Mm-hmm. Um and children with autism are no exception. They really should be allowed to move and play outside on a regular basis. And then um, finally, it helps with emotional regulation. You know, there's a really good reason why we have swings in our clinics is because we're trying to position them in all different positions to stimulate hair cells in different directions and develop um, a vestibular system. And it also helps regulate activity level, you know, if they're up here all the time you know, hyperactive, you know, to bring that back down naturally, and also emotions, like if they're really angry, to naturally bring that down, or um, excited. Um, So, you know, I was thinking about this a lot, like, you know, as children, we had a lot of outdoor play, and we were able to attend in school, Um, but we did, we we played outside for, um, I think, you know, when I asked people, the average response is four to five hours a day, is what people were playing on a school day in elementary school. Um, And when I went to Australia, it was like five to six hours, which was interesting. (laughs) Culturally, you guys were outside more. (laughs) um, And then now I'm hearing that kids are only getting 45 minutes to an hour and a half of outdoor play a day. And that's, so that's a significant decline in the amount of time that they're playing outside. And so anytime you change an environment that much, you're going to change child development. Um, so so it's very important to develop this vestibular system yeah. and right. you know a lot of clients that i see who are on the spectrum will display those behaviors um but it becomes a repetitive behavior so they'll do the back and forth rocking in the chair or they might spin endlessly they could spin for hours if you don't intervene so um i suppose it is about making it to a meaningful activity that's you know sort of yeah. a little bit socially acceptable so they're not sort of outcast from the other kids yeah yeah. And they, I wonder, too, if they had more time in outdoor play, would that reduce some of those mm. things that you're – do you know what is I mean? There any, yeah, is there any research on anything like that in terms of the therapeutic benefits of nature? Um, I mean, there is lots of research on different things, but in terms of the vestibular system and that, is there any sort of research on that? The, specifically the vestibular system, there's not. Um, but it would be interesting to look at um, – that specific specific study just on the repetitive behavior piece like Mm. i think there needs to be a lot more research um but there is there has been a significant amount of research like it helps attention it helps Mm. problem solve you know so well there is that study that was done um on children with adhd and it said that you know a 20 minute walk around the block or in the park is going to significantly improve a child's attention so you know if they're fidgeting and you know can't control themselves in the classroom take them outside you know 20 minutes and then they're going to be so much more productive when they come back in rather than telling them to sit still give them what their body needs to be able to learn and access that higher cognitive function Right, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Also, just engaging in play, like the occupation of a child is play, and outdoor play is a big part of their, or should be a big part of their world. You know, we've kind of forgotten about that. Um, so, you know, how can we support children um, with autism in outdoor play? Because that should be a big part of their life too, um, in their childhood. Mm, absolutely. So many children on the spectrum have difficulties with motor planning. So that's a big sort of area that I work on with a lot of kids um, because it's such a foundational skill, I think, being able to obviously initiate something, you know, plan it and um, Mm -hmm. have that motor result at the end, you know, be able to um, do what you want to do, basically. Um, You know, kids are very clumsy, they're awkward, they're accident prone, um, and children on the spectrum usually have difficulty um, doing movements that other kids find easy or pick up quite quickly. So if they're at a school dance, you know, the child with autism may not be able to sequence the the movements and different things like that. Um, You know, and they're the kids that will sit on the sidelines and watch everyone else participate. And this can be really hard, obviously, for the parents to watch because they want them to be involved and want them to participate. Um, How do you motivate these kids who um, are worried about engaging in maybe risk-taking activities or, um, 
yeah who don't sort of have that safety net and don't feel comfortable Mm. because of well, because their inability to motor plan and, the, and they don't know about their body awareness and body space and things like that yeah well I think so the what we see here is um, when you set up a play environment um, you you keep that in mind ahead of time like um, and you don't there's no expectations because it's play and so the, all the children will engage at their own level where they're at and there's no one judging them. Um, for instance, I'll, I keep saying the mud pose, but I feel like it's such a perfect example. Um, there will be kids that will stand on the outside of the mud puddle, um, and there will be kids totally immersed in it, and then there will be kids like instructing the other kids. Uh, but they're all engaged, and they're all excited. Um, they could be creating a giant obstacle course. Maybe they're passing stuff to other kids. I Almost all the time, all the kids are engaged. They're all at totally different levels, but... Um, and then what happens is later in the week you might see them go in further. But they self-regulate that. And I think that's the difference is when there is no adult expectations or like, you know, this is what we're doing right now, but it's set up like that and you are inspired, then the child takes ownership over the play experience. And they will do things that will surprise you. And I think that's a very different um, way of looking at it. But it's very exciting. Um, we've had behavioral specialists cry when we watch kids at Timbernook because they're like, I had no idea they could do that. Or I had no idea they they would they could play. Like um, because it's such a rudimentary thing. Um, and there's no re there doesn't need to be a reward. You know, it just it, the play itself is a reward. So um, Exactly. But it, but it is we don't see we don't see kids usually like not engaging to to that extreme for mm. I don't know mm. no so what about if parents listening in today if they want to engage in more nature play um, mm -hmm. are there any specific activities or things that they can do to help facilitate this is it just simply going to the beach or what what sort of action steps can they take away from mm -hmm. today's um, podcast so I would say to start really simple and even like in your own backyard um, you know, thinking about where the children are at too, like maybe if they're really, like if there's a lot of fear, maybe just, um, being outside on the deck, <laughs> I don't know, starting, but starting slowly. Um, and then, um, you know, just putting out some interesting objects, they're called loose parts. And that's something that people could look up. It's materials that don't have a specific purpose um, that they can explore with. Mm. Um, can you give us some use, examples? Sure. Yeah. So we'll use like baskets with nothing in them. Um, we'll use like tires, planks, um, shears that are see-through um, mm -hmm. that they can be used for building or constructing with or they might dress up with them. It's not dress up clothes. It's like open-ended. Um, tree cookies. So like if you slice a tree... A tree the tree cookies yeah. can be just about anything. Um, I see a lot of those in the childcare yeah. centers these days. Yeah, yes, mm. yeah. So they're very open-ended um, things. I I really think um, putting stuff near mud puddles, like and just like putting a plank and putting some different pitchers and like a mixing spoon, especially little ones, really tiny ones, so that they can explore with it. You could do like a crazy kitchen thing outside where you put a bowl of flour, um, another bowl of like noodle, like dry noodles, um, and um, like a muffin tins, different things, and just see what they do with it. And mm. like the little toddlers will often experiment. They might throw it in the hair. That's fine, but um, they will. <laughs> that's half will, the fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's very, it's very basic, but it's really neat because it's meeting them where they're at. That's it's open right. Mm. Another really fun one is like if you put up a big canvas and different colors, um, like plates with colored powder, um, and maybe they have a white shirt that can get, you know, they can throw it at each other, they can throw it at the, the um, canvas, but just experimenting and playing. Yeah. Um, and so it's very, very basic stuff. There's not like an expectation. It's open-ended. Whatever they do is fine. Um, yeah, and I think too, I think the parents have to be 
open to messy play you know sometimes it's it's not the yeah. child who doesn't want to get messy it's the parent who doesn't want them to yeah. get messy so um that's sort of an yeah. obstacle some parents yeah need to <laughs> yeah. Look and at. Mm. just yeah for the parents role like our our saying is step back but tune in so that they are there for safety but they really don't need to point things out they could just mm. um almost having a um a loving presence like just being there having a seat and smiling but just you know, not saying too much of anything and just see what the child does and following their lead, mm. um, see what they come up with. So it's their ideas and their, what mm. they feel. And just building on, yeah, and I suppose particularly with children with autism is just building on the play, um, you know, yeah. to, to develop that play, those play yes. skills. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, let's head to the five rapid fire questions okay. now. Alrighty, so what is one habit that parents can implement today? Okay, um, I would say just um, step outdoors and try setting up an area with loose parts um, like we just described and see what and see what they do and also um, and to step back and just be present would be my number one thing. Excellent. What do people never ask you that you wish they did? That's a good question. Um, it's a difficult I one. I don't think I have one. I get asked everything. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. People are curious and um, tapping into all the resources in your brain. <laughs> <laughs> if there was one book that you could recommend all parents read, what would that be? Besides Balance and Barefoot, it would be uh, Free to Learn um, by Peter Gray. And it's all about the, you know, what play really is and how um, play is a choice. It's mm. not necessarily directed by an adult. Mm, it's excellent. A really mm, I'll have to add that one to my list. Yeah. Um, what is one of your top three unfinished bucket list items? Oh, boy. I would like to go to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> visit Italy. Ah, <laughs> oh, that'd be lovely. I'll meet you there. <laughs> yep. Excellent travel is always on the list, isn't it? Yeah. There's so many places to see, so many things to do. Yeah. And if you could offer parents only one piece of advice, what would it be? I would say to just slow down. Um, to remember that childhood only comes once and to enjoy and cherish your children and it that um, children are not perfect and to love them for who they are oh beautiful couldn't have said it better myself <laughs> <laughs> so how can our listeners find more out about Timpanook if they're interested I know it's coming to Australia so it's really exciting um, and where can they get a copy of your book and find out more about your amazing work Sure. So Balance of Barefoot is on Barnes & Noble, Amazon, um, Indie.com, and um, Timbernook.com is our website. And so they can keep an eye on Timbernook as it comes um, to Australia. And there's a Facebook page, Timbernook Australia, so they can keep tabs on it. Oh, excellent. I haven't seen that yet. I've seen the American one. So I'll, um, yeah, suss that out. Thank you okay. so much, Angela, for taking the time out of your day to chat with us today. You are a true visionary in the world of OT, and I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Not a drama. Thank you so much. I will talk to you later. All right. Sounds good. Bye.